Welcome to the Real Crusades History Podcast. I'm Jay Stephen Roberts. I'll be your host. And we are starting a new series with this episode. Uh, we're going to be looking at the fall of Crusader Outremer over the course of several episodes here. So I'm very happy to welcome to the panel today, uh, Dr. Stephen Donaghy. Dr. Donaghy, welcome back. We are always glad to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And we're also glad to have Rand Lee Brown here today. Rand, how are you? Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Good to be. Always good to be here. Excellent. As we've kind of talked about how we're going to approach this discussion of the final years of Outremer, the rise of the Mamluks, some of these last sieges that go on at the end of the 13th century, we thought it might be interesting to start off with the Ninth Crusade, the last numbered crusade, as crude a tool as that is, as the, as the numbering system is. But to start off, Dr. Donaghy, I'd kind of like to start with you on this. How would you describe the overall situation in the Crusader states as we get into the 1270s, uh, you know, for, for the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Principality of Antioch? Markedly declining. In this, the sort of, you know, 1240s, just before La Forbie, things have been looking pretty rosy for them. Um, much of the territory that they'd lost after Hattin had been reclaimed or recaptured, Um by themselves or through the intervention of other crusades in the earlier 13th century. They heavily fortified the coastal areas about which they'd um, been settled in that time or they'd been depended upon after that Hattin period. So you have places like uh, great castles like Crack de Chevalier and Beaufort and Safed um, and even minor castles like um, the uh, Teutonic Knights at Montfort um, having been constructed. And the cities in which they resided along the coast, places like Acre and Tyre, Jaffa, Sidon, and briefly Ascalon, had all been refortified and repaired with new additions made. Acre expands considerably. And this had sort of firmly bolted them, the Frankish presence to the coast. Um, and, you know, they'd secured what they'd, they'd, they'd got. And so the, in the mid, mid 13th century, things aren't, aren't looking too bad. They're also exceedingly rich these uh, these cities along the coast are prime trading hubs and st are stopping off destinations between uh western europe and it's uh, the trade of the italian uh maritime republics like venice genoa pisa um with uh, the middle east for the great ports like alexandria as well as it, constantinople and uh, ports in the black sea so there's a lot of shipping going on in and around these areas and there's a lot of cash a lot of money flowing on and through these ships uh, to and from uh, into the ports of the Latin East as they conduct their trade with with the with the Middle East. Um, and these are these cities like Acre are great clearing houses for you know larger in, interior cities like Damascus or Aleppo, for example. Um, so on the one hand, the Crusader states are fairly well defended. They've got some very impressive fortifications and defences, but also exceedingly rich. I mean, we really shouldn't underestimate how much money is actually there. But on the other hand, as that sort of 1240s, 1250s, 1260s start to progress, the situation becomes increasingly fractured politically within the Crusader states. Um, in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Hohenstaufen, and the, the German emperors who had um, inherited the, the throne uh, with Frederick II in 1225 are absentee kings, leaving representatives and regents to do uh, their administration and their ruling for them, um, which had largely allowed the baronage to do what it wanted and get on doing its own thing without any overarching centralised authority telling them what to do. Um, so as a result, if there's a political vacuum, the barons move to fill it. And by the time you get to the 1250s and 1260s, the barons have no longer got the sort of external threat of the possibility of the emperor's um, servants and uh, representatives trying to make them do things. So they um, they start to infight and uh, turn on each other. So you have things like the War of St. Sebas uh, in the 1250s, where initially the Venetians and the Genoese um, are fighting for control of, of Acre. Uh, but it brings in princes of Antioch uh, and other great families like the Ebelins and the Montforts, um, supporting different sides, as well as the military orders, the Templars and the Hospitlers, backing different sides to, uh, to gain different political edges uh, in their own personal and local politics within the kingdom. 
And similar things happen in, in Tripoli and to an extent in Antioch, uh, where rival powers and factions are vying against each other um, between the counts and, and, and other nobles whom they support. And so the kingdom, the, the, the Latin East is well defended, it's, it's quite rich, but it's also quite broken and fractured inside. And the 1260s become a very problematic time. Um, many of the old generations have started to die away from the early 13th century, those who had lived immediately after Hattin um, and in the early 13th century. And with them goes the sort of great, uh, many of the great fortresses and city um, cities that have been def- built up and refortified since since then. Um, the 1260s sees a string string of, of defences go. Places like Antioch fall in 1268, along with Jaffa as well. Asaf and Caesarea are captured in 1265, Montfort in 1271. Um, so these great fortifications that the Latin East had depended on for so many years are starting to be pried loose one by one. So that by the time the Ninth Crusade, uh, the Eighth and Ninth Crusades are, are getting underway about 1270, um, things are starting to look pretty bleak, pretty grim, and uh, could quickly go either way unless there's intervention from the Latin West to stabilize the position or or radically change things. Yeah, that's interesting, and I think that you know a lot of people seem to almost connect this period, sort of the period when the Mamluks are making all these reconquests with the 1187 period, just almost like Saladin's conquests. We just kind of have this holdover until it's all kind of wiped out. But but yeah, that, that's one thing that, you know, I've really come to realize that we, we don't want to get wrong. I mean, we don't want to misunderstand how substantial the Crusader states were. In the wake of the Third Crusade, there was this really remarkable recovery. And I just think that that's kind of an, an interesting point of, you know, where we find ourselves now. Rand, did you want to talk a little bit about the Mamluks? The first half of the 13th century, the Crusader states are dealing with the Ayyubids for the most part. The Ayyubids have control of Syria and Egypt. Uh, That all changes, actually, uh, really over the course of the Seventh Crusade. The Ayyubids are removed from power, and we have this new dynasty. Uh, So who are the Mamluks that that come to power at at the middle of the 13th century, Rand? The Mamluks are a very interesting phenomenon within medieval Islamic history, they were a caste of slave soldiers, and most of them were recruited forcibly from foreigners, uh, not native uh, Arab, not native Egyptian Arabs, but uh, they mostly came from tribal peoples uh, in Central Asia and the Caucasus region. So many of the various Turkish tribes, and amongst them, they were granted, even though they were st- even though they were slaves, ostensibly they were they were still granted um, a very uh, special, one might even say a privileged uh, position within uh, Ayyubid society um, as the uh, as the specific warrior caste within them. They were they were usually very close to the centers of power. They exercised a lot of influence. They gathered a lot of political influence later on in the as we get towards the early to mid 13th, 13th centuries. Early 13th century, you have Mongol hordes show up from the east. Uh, at this time. Um, the Mongols had made their their major push west from Central Asia and ultimately from from the Far East where they originated, and um, really threw the Islamic world into chaos. Uh, they they sacked Baghdad uh, in the the, the infamous uh, uh, sack that that basically wiped that city off the map uh, for the next several generations. They steamrolled everything in their path, but as they started to get towards the, the Levant, um, things started to slow down for them. Uh, it was that period coincided almost perfectly with uh, a coup waged by the Mamluks and, and in particular, uh, the rise of the figure of Baybars. Um, Baybars was not a uh, native Ayyubid. He had been raised a, uh, a Mamluk um, and uh, they, they believed he was originally a Kipchak uh, Turk from from the Central Caucasus region, um, but he was he would eventually rise through the ranks to become the premier uh, figure of the Mamluks and and the, um, the figure who, along with his uh, co-conspirator, who I, his name I can't recall right now, 
um, but would would basically be the ones to overthrow the Ayyubids, who politically never really recovered from Salah Hadin's death uh, and and the political infighting and uh, family feuds that were uh, endemic amongst them. Baybars would emerge as probably one of the most dynamic uh, conquerors of the medieval Islamic world. He, uh, in fact, in, uh, many historians regard him as even more as even more dynamic uh, than Salah al-Din. Baybars uh, had an element. He, he was uh, he was a lot more aggressive uh, than Salah al-Din was, um, and he was a lot. He was uh, in some ways he was much more um, systematic. He was much more. Uh, thorough, you know, where, whereas Salah Hadin relied primarily on family, familial relationships and, and political alliances and uh, building coalitions. Baybars was very monolithic. He, he, he consolidated all power uh, unto himself and his own uh, regime and was, was not afraid to use force to achieve any of his objectives, even including against fellow Muslims. Um, who who stood in his way. Yeah, so he really goes from being a prominent Ayyubid general to, I mean, he's going he's gonna to be you know, the Sultan of Egypt. He's the, he really oversees the rise of the Mamluk dynasty. So, Dr. Donaghy, did you have any comments about the Mamluks and their rise and how they impacted the Crusader states? Yeah, and we, we, sh- we shouldn't underestimate the, the importance of, of the rise of the Mamluks and how that changes the sort of uh, attitudes and uh, the geography of the of the of the Middle East in the mid 13th century. Um, the Ayyubids had been were, fra- well, were fractious and and uh, divided with their own minor family disputes and petty politics that uh, you know never really allowed them to unite in the same way as they had done under Saladin. And while they were consistently a, a, a general threat to the the Crusader states in the, in the Lion East. Um, they never displayed an awful lot of interest in actively finishing them off and you know, completing what Saladin had started. They seemed quite content just to leave them to be what they're doing, so long as they didn't cause too much too much trouble or any unrest or threaten to destabilize the situation by uh, throwing their lot in with with one particular Ayyubid faction or another. Um, and it's not entirely surprising because Ayyubids were probably making quite a lot of money out of the these cities where, where they could ship a lot of their goods and, and uh, items to. And so, you know, they're, they're convenient things to have around. But the Mamluks change all of that. They're much more sort of centralized and militarized and determined than the Ayyubids, or the Ayyubid successors of Saladin, ever were. Um, and so when Baybars and, and others are, are rising in power, um, this is actually a sort of genuine threat to the continued existence of the Crusader states, especially as those Mamluks start to unite um, the various Egypt and Syria once again much more much more concertedly. Um, there are still Ayyubid princes um, floating about in places like Homs or Hama, um, occupying uh, positions of authority there. But they begin to fall under the Mamluk sway and the Mamluks be- become the more preeminent and more prominent power. And so once again, it sort of mirrors that period in the sort of 1160s, 1170s, um, this period a century later where the sort of, you know, emerging threats and the sh- looming shadow appearing over the Crusader states as a more united regional Islam under the Mamluks, just as it had done under Saladin, um, begins to truly threaten the continued survival of the Crusader states. So, Dr. Donaghy, let me ask you this. I don't know who wants to answer this first, but this thing with the Mongols. The Mongols did have a pretty big influence on on how some of this played out. Rand, do you want to go first on the Mongols? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. One, one thing um, that's very important about the, the, the coincidence or the, 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 the timing of Baybar's uh, rise within the Near East and, and the Mongol incursions uh, is that, that the, the, the Mongol invasions played a major role in basically crafting who, who Baybars became mm. and, and, and who the Mamluk regime became. Um, the, the Mongol incursions into the Near East during the 1260s and 1260s through 1270s um, constituted a far greater threat to uh, Islamic 
civilizations in the area than, than the Western Crusaders could have ever dreamed of. Um, the, you know, like I said, in 1258, um, the sack of Baghdad um, by Hulagu uh, reverberated across the Islamic world. It was, it, it was prob- perhaps one of the most disastrous uh, events and one of the most infamous events that ever occurred in medieval Islamic uh, um, uh, history. So um, as, as Mongol hordes begin pushing their way uh, towards the, east, the eastern Mediterranean, um, there's this very uh, there's a there's a there's a there's this major sense of panic and and, and emergency that that you start to see amongst um, uh, uh, Ayyubid and 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 also Mamluk uh, elements in that uh, especially since when they find out that there are uh, Latin Frankish uh, uh, baron you know political figures uh, most notably um, Bohemond the Fourth of Antioch the last. Uh, the last prince of an independent Antioch um, began actively courting Mongol uh, cooperation in preserving the the Frankish Crusader states. Uh, now, there was no, uh, contrary to what some might try to think, there was no concerted effort on the part of the West um, to to bring this kind of a partnership about. There there were some. There were some attempts here and there, but no grand uh, strategic movement to unite Frankish and Mongol uh, efforts in, in the Holy Land. Um, the, in fact, on the Western side, there was far, on the Latin side, there was far more suspicion of the Mongols um, than, than there ever was desire for cooperation. But um, there were attempts, most notably, there were a few diplomatic uh, attempts made by uh King Saint Louis the Ninth, um, for to to feel out uh, for for possible alliances, and then uh, and then like I said, the the co- the even uh, uh, outright cooperation, military cooperation that existed between um, the uh, Ilkhanate forces and uh, those of the forces those of uh, the, the Principality of Antioch under Bohemond IV. Um, in fact, I believe there was. Uh, um, I believe it was in 1260, I think, um, where uh, Bowman the Fourth and uh, a, a Mongol general actually uh, jointly took the city of Aleppo very briefly um, and and subjected it to a to a rather uh, uh, to a rather intense uh, sacking. Uh, so you know these are things that Baybars is looking at and and and, the, and his fellow Mamluks. Uh, in fact, it was the uh, in in 1259. Uh, I finally found it. Um, it 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 was the uh, Kutuz, who was a, a fellow Mamluk conspirator with uh, Baybars, actually used the Mongol incursions as the justification to overthrow the last Ayyubid Sultan. Um, this, this was seen as an emergency uh, that that. Um, needed to be handled by you know the, uh, the 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 grown-ups needed to be put in charge uh, of this and and uh, the threat needed to be answered long before uh, well not too long before but um, uh, before the Mamluks and, and Baybars in particular really turned their attentions towards the the last remnants of the Frankish kingdoms uh, they first had to deal with the Mongol threat uh, and they did rather. Uh, rather skillfully, um, the the Battle of Ain Yalut, um, which takes place uh, in the twelve in twelve sixty, uh, was a was a crushing defeat of the of the Mongol general Kitbuga, um, and uh, and it it ended the the really the the effective Mongol presence of uh, uh, within within the Levant and. Um, Baybars uh, skillfully, even though he wasn't the only general in that, the only Mamluk general uh, at that battle, he very skillfully um, maneuvered himself to take uh, the majority of the credit um, for it, and was and was hailed uh, as sort of the savior of Islamic civilization um, in the Near East, and uh, um, and I think then the. One of the reasons why you see Baybars turn with such ferocity on the, the Frankish kingdoms in the Holy Land is not so much be out of a desire because 
uh, for for jihad. Um, although he he had no problems using that as uh, you know using that as as popular justification, but was more so because I think there was a very genuine fear on the part of the the, the Islamic civilizations of the Near East of Mongol and Frankish cooperation um, that could very easily, if the Mongols were ever invited back, um, could have very easily uh, seen Mongol hordes pouring into Egypt, um, uh, just as they had in the, in the Fertile Crescent and, and in Mesopotamia. So that that was a major that it was a it was a major uh, point of um, uh, of diplomacy and sort of and, and uh, international strategy uh, on their on, on Bevar's part um, that I think he he wanted to annihilate um, any possibility of that ever happening um, and of that sort of a and of a threat of that magnitude um, you know ever coming into being. Dr. Donaghy, the Mamluks also, we kind of see sort of a shift in Turkish uh, military tactics. The Mamluks kind of adopt almost a heavy cavalry style, don't they, to some extent? It's a far, I mean, obviously the Mamluks are this, this military caste, so it's not surprising that they should, you know, adopt a a, mili- a more militaristic and uh, focused uh, a view in, in dealing with things. Um, so, yeah, they do they do implement some, some new changes. I mean, one thing they do implement that Baibar certainly implements um is a greater concentration and use of artillery pieces um in sieges the more so than his Ayyubid uh, predecessors had um the largest numbers in in sieges since um since Saladin in fact and in fact greater numbers than Saladin generally um in part so he can s- sort of crack the walls and uh, defenses of these um great fortifications the Franks have built by concentrating enough siege um sort of you know trebuchets stone throwing devices etc um in one area to be able to overcome them um because franks with a greater f- focus on defending their, their military architecture had advanced considerably um in comparison to those of their, their neighboring muslim realms um and correspondingly the the mamluks have to deal with this by by changing their own tactics and yeah this is all the the determination of of of, of by bars and the mamluks to to prosecute their war much more determinedly than, than previously. We're going to touch a little bit here on the Eighth Crusade, King Louis the Ninth's Second Crusade, if you will. This comes right before Edward embarks. Originally, the plan was for the two of them to act together. Louis goes to Tunis for this crusade. This is in 1270, and uh, to some extent, this is a reaction to the fall of Antioch in 1268 to the Mamluks. Dr. Donaghy, what do you think about the Eighth Crusade? Uh, what do you think about this decision to attack Tunis? I mean, what what was Louis trying to do there? Yeah, what is Louis trying to, to do? Um, I mean, one of the the usual things that come out that uh, is that it's all to do with the influence of his uh, his brother Charles of Anjou. Um, Charles had um, acquired control of southern Italy, the Kingdom of Sicily. Um, in the in the 1250s 1260s and tunis is sort of traditional rival power just across the straits um on the north african coast um the, in the past the kings of sicily had exerted control and dominance and influence over um and he's seeking to recreate that and he he co-opts or convinces louis um that rather than going on to the to the Latin East, to Cyprus or Egypt or somewhere like that, um, that he should stop and attack uh, Tunis because this would not only secure his base in southern Italy, um, but it would also potentially help um, the um, position of the Crusader states. And this is a pretty weak argument. The idea is that um, by weakening Tunis, that which uh, allegedly, according to some, might the 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 um, Sultan of Tunis was willing to convert to Christianity or some such. Um, that therefore might create a rival uh, power that could be launched against Egypt from from the west or or such like. Um, this is all sort of you know pie in the sky type stuff. There's no. It's very unlikely that the the Sultan or indeed anyone in in Tunis was ready to convert on mass to Christianity and to start attacking um, Mamluk Egypt. Um, but nevertheless, Louis is diverted um, and fatally for him ultimately 
so yeah, the Ninth Crusade is divided from the Eighth Crusade in terms of Edward the First's actions, and uh, Edward is going to end up. He's going to end up at at Acre. There's some interesting stuff going on when he arrives in the Holy Land. Baybars is actually besieging Tripoli. Tripoli very likely is going to fall to Baybars. However, Edward the First shows up. Just him putting in at Acre prompts. Baybars to to lift this siege, and so and so Tripoli is going to continue to exist uh, for some time after that, and probably more important to the the people within Tripoli at the time, uh, you know, their lives are going to be spared because uh, Baybars has made a habit of slaughtering towns that he conquers. Okay, so Rand, do you want to talk a little bit about Edward the First as a crusader? So he's still prince at this time. What do you think? He accomplishes. Tell me what you think about the Ninth Crusade, about Edward's uh, achievements here, or lack well, thereof. He, yeah, Ed- Edward, um, Prince Edward, um, at, at the time, although he would uh, eventually become King Edward uh, during the course of this, uh, while he was while he was in the Holy Land, um, his involvement in this in this crusade is very very interesting. Not not just from a perspective of um, of Crusades history, but also from the perspective of English medieval history, he the, um, this was a, a time of medieval history that was not um, England was not looking very good um, just shortly before this. Uh, they had um, after after King Richard's uh, King Richard the First very unfortunate death uh, before the Castle of Chalou, um and and the uh, the subsequent um, ascension of his hapless younger brother, uh, King John, um, English society got torn apart, um, by, by, um, disasters over with her, uh, Anavan empire, uh, holdings, uh, with the, the loss of the Anavan empire, uh, her, her continental holdings to the King of France. Um, and, uh, some very, very serious unrest, uh, social and political unrest back, back Within England itself, amongst the uh, amongst the, the aristocracy, um, the, the very independent-minded English aristocracy, um, that would eventually lead to uh, not only the, the multiple barons' revolts uh, that would occur during this period, but also the um, the, the much loved uh, document by uh, legal scholars and political scientists alike, uh, the Magna Carta. Um, so. Uh, you know, English society is in a lot of turmoil uh, at this time. In fact, um, just a few, just a not uh, just a few years prior to uh, Prince Edward uh, taking the cross, he had just uh, decisively won uh, for his father the the sort of the last battle of the of, of the Barons' Revolt, and that was the Battle of Evesham um, against the against the Baron uh, the 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 Baron rebels led by Simon de Montfort. Uh, the younger, um, the son of the more famous crusader, uh, Simon de Montfort the Elder. Um, so, uh, you know, the English political situation was by no means steady um, when when Edward, when Prince Edward uh, took off for the Holy Land. Um, so a lot of historians sort of remark about how Sort of unprecedented this was that you know I, this this shortly after a period of very intense instability uh, here's the 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 principal uh, warrior figure for the for the for the English crown uh, taking off to to the Holy Land. Um, however, there's some other things to consider that that the the expedition to the Holy Land was was very much also in Edward's in Prince Edward's favor. Um, it skyrocketed him uh, his reputation across Europe. Um, he was known as a very competent, uh, military commander, even though he was still, uh, very young, uh, at the time. Um, and, uh, it, it did a lot to place him in some of the highest circles of European politics, uh, and European power, um, at this time. So, uh, it, it, it was, there was a definite benefit, um, for him, um, and especially with him uh, signing on for basically what was supposed to be a joint campaign um, with uh, King St. Louis the IX, um, it also helped bring the English crown closer and in a much more friendly manner to, uh, the, the, uh, to the throne of France, um, thereby taking relieving a lot of pressure 
um, against the, the few remaining English holdings uh, in France, uh, like like in Gascony and in uh, and in Aquitaine. So um, it, it, it was there were there were definite political benefits, but but it's 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 worthy to note that that many historians, both then and now, express um, surprise that uh, you know that Prince Edward would make this move. Um, but you think he achieved anything? I in, think in the, that, for the Latin East, I mean, like for for the Crusader states. I did. I, I do. Um, it, it's a uh, um, you know I, I don't think we have time to to really cover exactly what went down, but um, there's an interesting episode that when on his way to the Holy Land, um, Edward made, Prince Edward made a very brief stop um, on the island of Cyprus, which had been conquered by his great uncle, uh, Richard I, during the Third Crusade, and um, had since then become sort of the, 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 um, the kingdom of Jerusalem in exile. Uh, and uh, uh, he was welcomed there with um, a, a very noted enthusiasm. I think there were many who, many uh, of, the, of the Frankish nobility sort of saw in him maybe a second Richard. Um, I think maybe they saw someone with um, enough military acumen, enough vigor, and uh, possibly access, hopefully access to enough men and materials that you know we could see perhaps a repeat of um, uh, Richard's, you know, Richard's military successes during the Third Crusade. Um, unfortunately, uh, this was going to prove to be a little bit of a disappointment in that. Um, Edward's army that he brought with him was was very very small. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, the, the chronicles uh, talk about only having about him only bringing about nine to thirteen ships worth of men, um, which at that time it would be surprising if he brought any more than a thousand um, with him. Um, however, he did bring some of the the cream of uh, English uh, political and military leadership with him uh, to include. A, uh, such noted figures as the as uh, Otto de Granson, um, who would later um, distinguish himself during the fall of Acre in twelve in twelve ninety one. Um, so you know there there were there were some very it, it was a very small force that he brought, but it was a very craft force that he brought, um, and they did have some successes in the field. Uh, they notably there was some um, uh, raids that Edward conducted that actually did um, foil. Many of of, of Baybar's um, moves in the area, and uh, and even brought uh, even brought Baybar's uh, to a negotiating table, which was uh, kind of unprecedented for Baybar's. Uh, he he was not typically one who was too fond of of, of negotiations, um, unlike his uh, unlike his much vaunted predecessor Salah Hadin. So. Um, you know, he, Edward did enough, and he brought enough to make himself felt, uh, and to and to to make his presence felt. Um, and he did. Uh, he he spent a lot of time shoring up uh, defenses within the few remaining cities in um, in Latin Ultramar, um, uh, and in the course of doing so, was introduced to uh, defensive and military engineering. Uh, that he would take back with him uh, to England, uh, and along with his master castle builder, uh, Master James of St. George, uh, would end up um, building many of the, uh, using using those uh, those engineering techniques to build uh, many of his castles that are found, that are still standing today in, in Wales um, when he, as, as king. So it, 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 I think, It'd be more accurate to say that the crusade had a lot more impact on Edward than Edward had on the crusade, um, unfortunately. And um, and it, while he did accomplish some, you know, maybe you could make the argument that his actions at least delayed the inevitable. Um, but unfortunately, unlike his predecessor, uh, the great Richard. Um, he he just did not have access to enough men uh, or materials to to really make his to to really uh, re- to to repeat the successes of of uh, of Richard during the Third Crusade. 
Yeah, I mean, um, the Ninth Crusade doesn't achieve the kind of conquests or you know military victories of something like the Third Crusade or the First Crusade. Certainly, uh, uh, but the Ninth Crusade is kind of it's kind of overlooked in terms of uh, it, it does have this this sort of impact. I mean, the thing that I've always found interesting is how Edward is able to achieve this ten year truce uh, mm-hmm. with 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 Baybars. So. Um, Dr. Donaghy, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the Ninth Crusade and uh, what did Edward achieve? What did he not achieve? What do you think? I agree very much with with with, with Rand. To be fair, I mean, Edward's a capable man. He's spent years. Um, uh, his, his father, Henry III, had given him um, control of Gascony and things like that. So he's an experienced administrator and uh, leader of men. Um, he'd. Um, experienced lord he'd been involved in the various baronial conflicts that had preceded um his departure in the sort of 1250s 1260s um at the battles of lewis and, and eversham and things like that um Eversham. so he's an experienced man capable administrator capable um commander he's a good choice for for someone to go out on crusade um and he heads out very quickly but he's not got very men many men with him i mean this idea is they've got about a thousand men maybe the, a few hundred knights and they're that's a a small force but very but but a capable one um but then he's expecting to arrive at tunis um and find a a much larger army the entirety of the of the kingdom of france um you know sort of there with with, with louis the ninth but of course by the time he arrives it's as everyone is withdrawing after the death of after the death of louis um so he moves on onto the Latin East anyway, um, with this small but dedicated force. And while he hasn't got enough men to achieve any meaningful or lasting permanent conquests or, uh, or, or, or things like that, he doesn't actually have the numbers to be able to do it. There is the possibility that if he can combine with the native baronage of Jerusalem and Cyprus, he might have a suitable enough force to make some meaningful impact, maybe much in the same way as his uncle Richard of Cornwall had done, where Ascalon or something can be recaptured, or or, or some other city uh, that had recently fallen to Baybars or something can be resecured or, or refortified. Um, something small but meaningful in that way. Um, but internal divisions within the Kingdom of Jerusalem itself, within Cyprus, the Cypriot barons are, are proving increasingly reluctant to go to. Uh, the Syrian mainland to to to, to fight um, um, w- without being uh, without further encouragement. Um, so he quickly realizes he just there's not much that he can really achieve. He makes some important raids. He sends a few messages to the Mongols and things like that, and uh, helps defend Acre from from raids and attacks towards it from the mountains. But there's he just there's nothing he can actually meaningfully achieve on a greater scale with the forces he's got available to him. So he's got very little choice but to to make a, a peace treaty with 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 um, with Baybars with the Mamluks, so that at the very least he can buy more time for the Latin East. So he makes this sort of ten year, ten month, and ten day um, treaty, which I think is the, the longest that could possibly be, um, depending on which particular school of of of, of uh, Islamic legal thought you you subscribe to. Um, that could be made and that is very important i mean we, we remember that things look pretty precarious after the third crusade when there's only a two or three there's only a, like a three-year peace treaty but fortunately saladin had died um throwing everything up in the air but frederick ii back in 1229 had made this a 10-year peace treaty um with the ayubids and that had resulted in a sizable crusade of the baron's crusade appearing in the late 1230s and the 1240s with Edward's own uncle, uh, Richard of Cornwall, and that had proved relatively successful, um, if more through diplomatic means than actual direct fighting. Um, so the race Edward has bought time for, and an important time, vital time, in which something else can be done, something else can be achieved. Maybe Edward can come back, maybe the next king of France can, can launch another crusade, something. Maybe Charles of Anjou, um, who is building his power in in southern Italy, it can do something about the the Latinese. That gives the opportunity for someone else to try and make an effort to save the the the, the Latinese. And there is one thing. I mean, we, he's 
got several other men with him. He's got his own brother, Edmund of Lancaster, um, with him. So both heirs to the English throne are on crusade at this time, um, which is a bit risky, if, if anything, especially since there's obviously the story of the assassins with the poisoned blades attempting to stab Edward. Um, but um, he also has um, the Archdeacon of um, Liege with him, which is Theobald Visconti, who goes on to become Pope Gregory X um, shortly afterwards. And he holds the uh, a, a, a great council at uh, Lyon, the Council of Lyon in 1274, where the crusade is once again back on the agenda and he's trying to make something of it to try and once again motivate the um, uh, the, the magnates of, of Western Europe to save the, the Latin, save their, their, co their brethren in the Latin East. Um, meets only some success. But nevertheless, he's got this individual with him and... He was there with Edward on the crusade. So the release, that is another outcome of Edward's crusade. The person who would later go on to be a pope was a participant alongside uh, the young king, the young prince. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very much sort of like the situation in the Latin East is is dire. You know, the, the, the patient is hemorrhaging and you've only got a basic first aid kit to be able to try and, uh, you know, preserve life for as long as possible. Um, and you're in desperate need of some much more, uh, much more, you know, uh, vital surgery that they aren't simply able to provide at the time. Um, I think it kind of proves the sort of by the late 13th century that only a concerted national effort by um, one of the great states of, of, of the Latin West, um, England on in, in its entirety or um, the Kingdom of France or, or the uh, Holy Roman Empire or some such, is capable of actually making a meaningful contribution to the continued defense of the kingdom. These smaller um, expeditions that have been put out across the, the mid uh, 13th century up until the, the Ninth Crusade um, are only buying a little more time for the Crusader states at this point. Why, uh, Dr. Donaghy, why was Baybars willing to even make a treaty with Edward? Um, I think it's because the Mongols are still there. I mean, they've they've had this victory at Angela, um back in 1260, which had preserved uh, their power and certainly you know catapulted helped catapult the, the Mamluks to even greater power in Egypt and Syria, um, because it, Syria had been quite had been ravaged by the the Mongols um, and Egypt had not, thus kind of centralising the importance of this sort of un undamaged unblemished um egypt and uh, the mongol and the 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 mamluk presence therein um allowing them to snap up syria with a bit, a bit greater ease um in the wake of the mongols but the mongols are still there um the mongols do carry out a large raid in 1271 um sweeping down um it's not, it's not a huge army or anything like that not sort of as it had been in uh Ein Jaluk previously or uh, anything like that but there are still it's still a substantial force that sweeps down towards Aleppo and Aleppo is uh, briefly, uh, briefly uh, um, sort of abandoned uh, and such like. And this provides a window that allows Edward to make various raids of his own. But the Mongols are still there. They're still a threat. And there's no guarantee that somewhere like Aleppo, somewhere like Damascus or another one of the important cities in the region might suddenly be snapped up by an enterprising Mongol uh, general or, or raiding party or something like that. So Baibaz, while he knows the Mongols might not pose the same great threat they once had done um there's still a problem that he has to face um and he's still got to secure his position and the position of the man looks much more assertedly um than he has so and you have edwards and these crusaders and um the, the franks of the latin east and their annoyance they're, they're a problem they're an annoyance um they can be dealt with in due course but they're not necessarily high on his, his list of priorities. So I think that the, the continued presence of the Mongols and the potential threat they they, they uh, present to them are the main reasons why he agrees to it rather than and then any innate threat from Edward or anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think you know you know one one thing we we are gonna just have to hit on briefly is uh, like you mentioned, Doctor Donaghy, the attempted assassination. Of Edward, uh, this, this is kind of one of these great little, uh, you know, set piece moments in the history of the Crusades. Uh, so, Rand, what do you think was going on there? Do you think that was Baybars trying to to get rid of Edward, or 
Um, I mean, that's the that, that's the historical consensus. Um, you know, while while it's uh, very tempting to you know want to draw parallels to the Hashashin and the old man of the old man on the mountain and things like that, um, you know, the 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 assassins at that time were were not anywhere near as big a player as they had as they had been in earlier times. Um, so, and and Baybars had proven himself uh, quite adept um, in his previous career at uh, using the using assassination um, as a as a tool um, during his rise to power. Uh, in fact, even uh, assassinating his own uh, his own fellow uh, Mamluk um, conspirator uh, that overthrew the that overthrew the Ayyubids, uh, um, uh He he murdered. Uh, he had assassinated. Um, after uh, inviting him to dinner, you know, so uh, Baybars was very adept um, at at these sorts of uh, you know this sort of political wet work, um, and I think he he saw in Edward someone who posed a, a, a significant threat um, to his, I, you know, maybe in some ways he he maybe saw in in Edward a, a, a repeat of a you know of a, of, a, of a King Richard. Or, or even, or even his uncle, um, you know, Richard of Cornwall. So, um, you know, he, the the last thing Baybars needed, as he was rolling up his conquest of of the Levant, was a a highly skilled, in both military and administrative affairs, a highly skilled leader from the Latin West, um, who could who could very easily uh, and very adeptly put roadblocks in his path. So, um, you know, the, the idea that, that Bevar's sent him, I, I think is the, is the sound one. Um, but, uh, and, and there's, there's even some, uh, while, while the, the accounts of the times of the assassination attempt are not terribly reliable, um, there, there are even, uh, historians of the time, like, uh, like Walter of Gibor, who, who, Postulate that you know that Baybars was the one behind it. Um, so it's I, I would think there's a pretty significant consensus on on that. What do you think, Doctor Donaghy? I mean, do you think that could have been Baybars or I mean, could very well be? It's it's hard to know really. I mean, Baybars apparently sent a letter to you know um, Edward, you know, congratulating him on his survival and all of that sort of thing. Obviously, to show that it clearly wasn't him. Um, all of that <laughs> sort of thing. Um, who knows? Either way, it's it's one of those sort of episodes that at the very least make a for a, a very good story, for a very good yarn um, that sort of come out of, of the Crusades at the very least. Um, something for flair for the dramatic. Um, but he's attacked and, you know, it takes him a little while to recover and everything. And he, he doesn't sort of really recover until Edward's actually left the Latin East and is recuperating briefly in, in Sicily. Um, but nevertheless, I mean... Maybe, I mean, the, maybe Ed Baybars has the fear that, yes, he might be another Richard, that he might come back, um, that the forces... Uh, Baybars would have been aware of, obviously, the stories of, 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 of Richard the Lionheart and everything from, uh, uh, from, from you know, from earlier generations. The old days. Um, that, the old days, yeah, that, that, that's something that might happen. Um, maybe not, or, you know, um, hard to say, really, isn't it? Um, it's one of the sort of mysteries. It probably, yeah, Baybars is the most likely candidate, um, but... Who's ever really going to know? Unfortunately, yeah, yeah it's it, it makes for a a, a good little uh, episode at the close of the Crusades. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, I'm really glad to have you guys here to talk about this. Um, and uh, you know, we are going to continue uh, this discussion of the fall of Outremer next time. And I think this is a really interesting period. So I'm glad we're talking about it. So does does anybody have anything else that they want to add to this discussion as we as we close out here? Rand, Dr. Donaghy, either of you? Uh, um, I suppose the only thing I might want to say is that the Mongols um, probably inadvertently are sort of, you know, a great influencing factor in the Middle East mm -hmm. that not by any specific direct direct action they'd intended to take. Um but more as in the consequences of just what they what what that they turned up and, and what they were doing. Um, that had it not been for the Mongols appearing, presenting this great threat, destroying the sort of Ayyubid uh, structures of Syria and such like, and that the Mamluks were able to stop them at at Ain Jalut, um, 
that how much of a, a greater threat the Mamluks would have posed or how long it would have taken them to become this greater threat um, might very well have, you know, been thwarted or just taken taken a lot longer. Um, as I think, you know, we should probably underestimate that you know, the unintentional consequences of, of, of the Mongols in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Uh, one wonders if perhaps the, the status quo of the Ayyubids and um, their relationship with the Crusader states might not have endured quite a bit longer had we not seen this great dramatic rise of the Mongols. Um, especially since the, the Ayyubids, uh, especially after Salah ad death, um, showed uh, a, a great deal of tolerance, probably economically motivated, um, to the, 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 the mercantile interests that the that the crusader coastal cities provided for that region um the there was a um trade really did become probably one of the most powerful factors in that in their relationship um with each other during the during the early um 13th century uh so you know it it is i think i think uh i think dr donahue is very correct in that it really is the appearance of, of the Mongol uh, migrations that that kickstarts the the concerted destruction of the Frankish presence in in the Levant. Um, you know, granted, uh, you know, absolutely not on purpose. Um, in fact, it's hard to argue if there was really much of a grand purpose in anything the Mongols did um, anywhere they went. Uh, but you know, it's. Uh, it, it is definitely a, a, an unforeseen consequence. I think there's one other very important detail that comes out in this crusade, and that is uh, if you get into the details of Edwards, Prince Edward's uh, recruitment efforts back in England for this crusade, um, despite having papal legates preaching the crusade throughout England uh, and, and France uh, and English-held t- territories in France, um, Contemporary chroniclers of the time remark upon the the almost non-existent uh, enthusiasm for this for the for the crusade, um, especially amongst the more common people. Um, this is in marked contrast to many of the great crusades from prior, hmm. um, where there was you know this massive popular uh, support behind it. Um, the in fact, there were some. Uh, there were uh, when the papal legates who were preaching the crusade actually showed up in England. Um, I believe it was in twelve. Um, I believe it was in twelve seventy um, when they arrived. Uh, Parliament, um, the the Parliament that was sitting that year, um, didn't even um, didn't even want to allow them in the country. Uh, there was they, they actually were were so against the idea of a crusade being preached they didn't even want them they didn't want those who were preaching it to be allowed entrance into the into the realm um so it's very interesting to see almost across all of europe um really a a a, a drying up of the the old crusader enthusiasm that had made so many of the prior crusades so successful um and you're, hmm. you just do not see the the, the popular enthusiasm anymore um, so, for the crusade. Was the idea of crusading kind of becoming like sort of a fanciful dream of the past, maybe kind of outdated? Uh, you know, I, I, think, and I think this is something that we, we are probably going to need to do an entire episode on. Um, but hmm. uh, I, I think there, is, there, there are a lot of things going on culturally, socially, politically uh, within Western Europe at that time. That I think, you know, at the at the risk of perhaps oversimplifying it, I think it, it is sort of a, you know, the old crusading zeal that you know had been uh, ignited in twelve in, in ten ninety five at, at Clermont is uh, is really it is it's kind of becoming this uh, this this relic, um, you know, of, of, of the past. Uh, you know, and and you know, there are still leaders. There's still political leadership in Europe who, who at the very least, pay lip service to it. Um, you will continue to see that all the way up into uh, all the way up into uh, the the Reformation in the early modern period. Um, but it, as far as just the common people, 
um, local interests, national interests are, are becoming more important. Um, so what do you think, Dr. Donaghy? Is that, is that kind of what we, we see going on here? There's just less. I mean, yes. I mean, to, you know, simplify the, the entire situation because a, a topic you could easily spend many hours talking about yeah. just by itself. Um, ultimately, Europe, the, the states of, of Western Europe, England, France, etc., have all got their own problems. Um, they're all trying. This is all the period where the sort of beginnings of national identity and the beginnings of sort of the formation of nations, the nations is beginning, and they've they've got a host of their own problems to be dealing with, and crusading is prohibitively expensive it's ludicrously expensive to do um they simply don't have the 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 time the opportunity or the inclination or the finances uh to be able to make the same concerted efforts they want did and more so the relative unsuccess you know the the, the lack of success that they've been having certainly must again have been another contributing factor um is it really worth going on crusade um as as as, as uh, to 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 continue to prop up the Latin East when options for crusading much more closer to home were much more readily available. Um, Spain, the Baltic, things like that, heretics, uh, enemies of the Pope, etc., which had also developed. Is it that because the nature of crusading has diversified and developed across the 13th century mm-hmm. to include other theatres of conflict? that this dilutes the the attentions away from the Latin East where it was originally projected and actually is most ultimately needed. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, to think about how different Europe was at this time than say, if we go, go all the way back to 1095, I mean, it's just, it's remarkable the the changes that, uh, these, these, you know, what once were regions are becoming these, these, uh, sort of proto nation states. I mean, not, I, I'm almost hesitant to put it in those terms, but so, okay. Well, I think we've really, we've, we've kind of done a pretty good job of covering um, some of these, these big topics related to the ninth crusade and kind of the beginning of the end for, for Outremer. You know, we've done some videos before where we've just sort of talked about the just actual events of the ninth crusade. So I think this, this was kind of a good chance to sort of talk about some of the big topics related to it. So, uh, I want to thank both of you for being here. Uh, Rand, thanks so much for being here and contributing. My pleasure as always. It was great to have you as usual. And Dr. Donaghy, we're always glad to have you with us. Thanks for contributing. Thank you very much. Excellent. So we will be back uh, next week with another installment in this, uh, this look at the fall of Outremer. Uh, this is Real Crusades History. You can find us at realcrusadeshistory.com. Thank you. Thanks for watching. This channel posts a new video or podcast every Monday. My historical novel, Why Does the Heathen Rage, is available now on Amazon. Click on the link in the info box below the video to get your copy. Also, check out the Real Crusades History blog at realcrusadeshistory.com, where Dr. Helena Schroeder posts a weekly article on Crusades history.